I can't believe that it's already the middle of Lent. And right in the middle of Lent, the church projects the image of the cross. And soon we will see that towards the end of the liturgy, we're going to process around the church with the cross decorated with beautiful flowers. Strange, an object of torture, and we have it as a symbol of life. And right in the middle of Lent, we have this small Pascha. In other words, we are venerating the cross, decorated with flowers, as the life-giving cross. And these are things that are very difficult to understand. In fact, we can't understand them. We can only experience them. And Christ's words in the Gospel today are so enigmatic, very strange, going absolutely against the logic of the world, the cutthroat logic of, you know, the big fish eats the small fish. That's the way we work. All our life is all about self-preservation. It turns out that Christ tells us that if you're going to do that, you're going to die. In other words, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to lose your life, thinking that you're gaining your life. Very strange. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. How strange. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. What does this have to do with anything? How does this save us? How can this encourage us in the middle of Great Lent where we begin to get tired, right, of Great Lent and all the exercises and more prayer and so on and so forth? Right in the middle, the church gives us the cross to encourage us to keep on going. How is this possible? Well, outside of Christ, it doesn't make sense. But only in the experience of Christ and in the experience of the cross, we understand that Yes, it is a folly to the Greeks and a scandal for the Jews. But this is the power of God. It's the wisdom of God made perfect in weakness. Everything is turned around. Everything is turned upside down. And really what we're talking about here is the law of love, which is the law of the cross, against the law of self-preservation which is the root of war. The law of self-preservation is what we usually do. Like I just said before, the big fish eats the little fish. That is why we have wars, because we're all about preserving ourselves, which means everyone else is the enemy. And Christ says the opposite, love your enemies. And love is all about coming out of ourselves. And love doesn't make sense unless you're in love, right? If you see someone who is in love, you think that person is crazy. What crazy things we do when we're in love. You know, we sacrifice ourselves. We become crazy. Doesn't make sense, but it leads to life. In the same way, the cross is the ultimate sign of love. And in this way, this is the only thing that really makes sense and really leads to life. It's the only thing that gives meaning to everything else. And it's God's way of becoming human and our way of becoming God. And that's why this is a small Pascha. Because we chant, you know, Christos Anesti et Necron Thanato Thanatopatisas. Christ has trampled death by death. The original crucifixes stress the fact that Christ is that person who in one movement with death gave us life. What am I trying to say? We like to say that, oh, Okay, Christ is on the cross, and because he's a human being, he died, but because he's God, he got out of the grave. No, that's wrong. That's not it. We're separating Christ into two people. There's the human being over here dying, and there's the living God over there. That's wrong. It's one person. And therefore, we know that human beings cannot give life, and we know that gods cannot die, but in Christ, those two things are together, dying and giving life. And dying becomes life. And we are one with Christ, and therefore our life also can be life-giving. However, the trick is this. We have to take up our cross. In other words, everyone dies. That's in common. 
And that's why Christ chose death, because that's the one thing we all have in common. Some of us are poor, some of us are rich, some of us are smart, some of us are not. But everyone has one thing in common, and that's death. And therefore, Christ chose this as the way to become God-like, because it's something that we can all do. It's totally accessible. But it's the way we do it. How did he die? He died on the cross. How did he die? By laying his life for the other. And inasmuch as we do the same thing, inasmuch as we, throughout our life, die to ourselves, our selfish desires, and sacrifice ourselves for the others, in other words, if we live our life through death, through dying to ourselves, then death cannot touch us because we've already entered into it through death. So death is powerless against us. This is the paradox of Christianity that's so difficult to understand. And the epistle says that we have a high priest who came from the heavens, but he understands us because he went through, despite the fact that he's up there, he's not just up there, he went down into our depths. And the epistle says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses because he's been through all the stuff that we go through and worse, but he was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. All of humanity is represented by the two crosses on either side of Christ. You know, there's Christ in the middle, and then there's the thief on the right and the thief on the left. And the one thief said, you know, remember me when you're in your kingdom. Whereas the other thief said, if you're Christ, get down from the cross and save us. Two ways of being. All people belong to either one or the other category. Either they are crucified or they are crucifiers. So the thief that said to Christ, get down, says, it's God's fault. Save us if you think you're God. That's what we do when we blame others and we blame God. Whereas the other thief said, you know what? In the end, maybe we deserve it. That's what he said, because he really was a thief. Christ, though, did not deserve it, but he was on that cross. And therefore, if we look at things in this context, we see that the cross challenges and overturns all human assumptions about power and glory. That thing I said before about the big fish and the small fish, it's baloney. That's the world turned upside down. And since the world already is turned upside down, the cross turns it upside down again, and therefore it makes it right side up. So the cross restores everything. And we need to keep on lifting up our cross and understand that this difficult journey leads somewhere. And that's what the church wants to impress upon us by placing the cross and the veneration of the cross right smack in the middle of Great Lent. That it's going somewhere that it's not useless. It all means something. But we have to keep up the good fight. This is the only way to flourish as a human being. There are no other ways. All people are either crucifiers or crucified. If you're crucified, you're in good company. You're in company with Christ, whose death is life-giving. And then we can understand not with our mind, but feel in our guts what the church is chanting today. What does she chant? Your cross, O Lord, is life and resurrection of your people. Your cross is the guardian of the whole universe. Amen.